Let's take a moment to hear from this week's sponsor, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Pre portioned ingredients help cut down on food waste, while step by step instructions make cooking a breeze, not so much of a chore. HelloFresh gets that you want options when it comes to what you want to make for dinner. Not just the same old thing all the time. That's why they offer 40 recipes to choose from every single week. So you'll never get bored and you can always find something new to try and love. And personally, that's why I love HelloFresh because I live alone and it's easy for me to turn to HelloFresh for a quick and easy meal. So go to HelloFresh.com slash who killed 50 and use the code who killed 50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash WhoKilled50 and use the code WhoKilled50 for 50% off plus free shipping. This is America's number one meal kit, so enjoy HelloFresh. Slow Burn Media and Evergreen Podcast presents... Who Killed, a podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. My question would be to you right off the bat is why, after so many years of silence, never having a media interview, and people have said that you have given them interviews in your Well, that's hogwash. Yeah. That's that's strictly hogwash. So we're saying I'm constantly told that that I'm misquoted constantly, saying that I I said this and I said that, and it's not happened. So it's pretty well established in this. This is the first time you're speaking publicly uh, about your case. Right. Yeah. I've always felt that my attorneys were handling it, and, and they said to keep a low profile and stay away from it. And uh, in light of all that has been used against me mm-hmm. in the media, they've, they've created this fantasy monster image, and it's been going on for the last 12 years. And I've ever had no comment, and I had no uh, need to talk to the media for the simple reason that they were looking for sensationalism and they were looking for the monster. When you say fantasy monster uh, image, uh, what, what are you referring to by that? Well, the idea that the, that I'm I'm a homosexual thrill killer and all that that garbage, and uh, they have painted this image of me that uh, like I, I strolled down the streets and stalked young boys and, and slaughtered them. Hell, if you could see my schedule, my work schedule, you know damn well that I was never out there. Well, you you were now you were indicted, convicted, and sentenced on 33 counts of of, of uh, homicide. Is that correct? That's correct. Hello and welcome to episode 162 of Who Killed? I am your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media and Evergreen Podcast production. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week with Nick from True Crime Garage. It's possible that he he could have killed some more because he he didn't... He wasn't... You know, some of these guys, when they when they get taken down, when they get discovered, they get locked up, they, they confess to everything. And, and I actually believe, listening to your good coverage that you did on, on Jeffrey Dahmer's case, I actually believe that Dahmer probably told us about everything that he did or everything that he remembers doing. Remember, he was a, quite the alcoholic, so there could be a, a situation where there, there could be a victim or, or a situation where he... It has done something that he doesn't fully recall. But uh, I think that Dahmer did want to tell, uh, because I think in a way that Dahmer wanted to understand for himself why he was what he was. I don't think he, as intelligent as he was, I don't think he fully understood why he was that way. And we we all know of his, his upbringing, you know, with the parents fighting constantly. And, you know, nobody... Nobody has a perfect childhood, um, but and Dahmer certainly didn't. But he he goes out of his way to to tell the public that this has nothing to do with my childhood, has nothing to do with my upbringing or my parents or even society. Uh, he, he there's something wrong with me, and I don't fully understand it. He doesn't use those exact words, but I I believe that's exactly how he felt, and in a way, confessing to some of those was a way to try to understand better himself who he was and why he was what he was and and why he did the things he did. And 
also it's also a form of a way to repent as well and to and, and to try to seek the forgiveness of his father who he very much cared for now gacy is is quite the opposite where he, he he's able to you know t- he talked a little bit about some of his crimes but but not much and i remember one of a really good piece of material to to review in gacy's case there's a great book out there called john wayne gacy defending a monster and that is by the the man who represented Gacy at his trial. And this guy was a brilliant attorney who says, when, when you are sitting with somebody like John Wayne Gacy, when you take that individual on as a client, your job is not to get a not guilty verdict. Your job is to spare your client the death penalty, to save his life because this man is guilty. This lawyer said, this guy's guilty as hell. He's a monster. And he he took on a lot of hate. A lot of people hated him for defending such a horrible individual. And he said, you know, it was my duty uh, as, a, as, a, as an officer of the court. It was my, my job. It was my duty to defend this man, but not to defend him to the point that he's innocent because I know he's not innocent. I'm just going to try to spare him the death penalty and try to save his life and now we know of course that john wayne gacy thankfully you know i'm not i don't want to get political here but in some cases in some cases if you're not for the death penalty then uh this is one of those cases where you cannot have this man that you cannot risk this man getting out ever and the only way to do so is to sentence him to die and to kill him and if this guy is breathing he's dangerous And thankfully, Gacy's no longer breathing. And Gacy's a weird one for me. I say weird one, I mean serial killer. He's a weird serial killer for me because I remember hearing on the radio him, you know, not not too long after he was executed. I I was I had a paper route back then. This was uh, 1994, and I believe it was like middle of the week. I'm out. Doing my thing, riding my, I had a dino, beautiful dino bike, uh, blue. I had a red dino. You remember dino? I had a red dino. Yeah. yeah. Ma- Dinos mag, are cool. Mag wheels. Yes. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> and I was, I was held on my blue dino. Uh, I even had the, uh, the, uh, the racing numbers on the, on the front, even though I never raced it, <laughs> but, uh, I, I had my blue dino. I'm out tossing papers on, on front doorsteps and I would listen to, Usually I'm listening to tapes, but sometimes I would just put on the the local radio station. And, you know, back then they would break every couple songs and give you some news between the commercials. And I was out tossing papers on doorsteps when they came over and they said, uh, 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 I can't remember. I'm I'm paraphrasing here, but it was uh, you know, at 6.01 a.m. this morning, killer John Wayne Gacy was was put to death in in the state of illinois and illinois no longer has the uh death penalty but he's a weird one for me because i remember hearing that news that that breaking news of when when they put him to death yeah that's like when um i remember bundy when they put bundy to death um because that was they had the, had a beautiful barbecue outside they did uh, they, with lots of people they did have a um a, a tailgate is what they called it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> burn bundy burn but I I believe that there wouldn't have been too many people that would have been, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that would have uh, had a problem with seeing John Wayne Gacy. No. Put that. Think of all the victims here. I mean, we, we talk about 33 known victims that, that he killed. 33 known victims that he killed. But let's expand that out further. These are 33 individuals that all had families. 33 families that fell victim to John Wayne Gacy and that their lives were forever disrupted, destroyed, and, I mean, just sent down this path of misery and loss and heartbreak because of this monster. 33 families, 33 families that that have to live a nightmare because of this guy. Yeah, and all those people, I would have to say, you know, thank goodness for the death penalty because they do get some bit of closure where that person isn't sitting in jail you know spending our tax dollars and basically well what? 
and, and you know, you know, I was somewhere years ago, and and I was kind of applauding the the Ted Bundy being executed, and somebody asked me a very very good question, and it was, hey, don't you think that we missed out on on learning a lot from this individual by putting him to death, and let's take that and, and pose that question in regard to John Wayne Gacy. He's not willing to talk about his crimes. So I don't know that we missed out on learning anything with John Wayne Gacy. And I think we, I think we have a really good understanding of him and, and what he was and his methods and, and everything all of these years later. And he's, we don't have the threat of him doing this to anybody ever again. So I, I think it's a win-win in this situation. Now, there is some speculation about Robin Gecht, and um, I, I've not watched, I think it's a show, Devil in Disguise. I've not watched that show where I think that, you know, we have the situation of Gacy, who's... Gacy, one of his things that he would he would constantly bring up was, I couldn't have done this by myself, or I didn't do this. These These people were just killed in my home. And I had to dispose of their bodies on occasion. He put he put four of them in he put four of his victims in in the lake, I believe, and the rest of them were buried. One was in a river in and around his house. Yeah, yeah, four. Sorry, four in the river. Yeah, and then um, yeah, like the first body. They found the first body on. Oh gosh, what was it? December twenty third. And then it was just like body after body after body in the crawl space, in a crawl space of, of your home. And I forgot to mention earlier that um, during one of the interviews before the arrest and before, you know, everything happened, they interviewed, I'm guessing it was his roommate, the Rossi character, this Rossi guy, um, and how he had put down... 10 bags of lime in the uh, crawl space. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to say that's kind of suspicious. I mean, if I was, and this is what the, this is what it says. It says, uh, a second search warrant came out and, uh, Rossi was interviewed a second time. This time he was more cooperative and he informed detectives in the summer of 1977 at Gacy's behest. He had spread 10 bags of lime in the crawl space of the Gacy's home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to say to those police officers, good job for following up on that because that's actually exactly where they would find all these people. And um, it's interesting how quickly when when Robert was you, – you said you focused on Robert Peast and your guys' um, coverage of John Wayne Gacy, and I can understand why because – like you mentioned, it's he seems so much like yourself. Like, oh yeah, he's working for an extra. He wants money for a new car or a car, a car in general, and he's yeah. going to go out of his way to do it. And the fact that he was like basically the one thing that led to the demise of John Wayne Gacy, and that was nine days after he was disappeared. He disappeared. That Gacy confessed. So I mean, it's yeah. um it's really kind of wild. Like he goes from being this crazy lunatic killer. I mean, he's killing pretty constantly. I mean, he's picking up, let's see, his first murder was in 72 and then 74, 75. And then he, basically he was just like a cruiser at that point and picked up, you know, random people here and there. And another thing about Gacy that I always found weird, and this is just more of a psychological thing that's interesting, is that, you know, he had, he was clearly bisexual. I mean, he even told his wife he was, which is, which is fine, you know, whatever. Um, but the fact that he wouldn't really accept that, and so when he would commit these sexual acts on these people, he would feel guilty about doing so and so he would murder them and i mean i don't know if that's a theory that i've heard throughout the years or whatever but it's definitely been well, bandied that, about yeah oh that's definitely a theory that 
especially early on in in this case and you know but back when he was apprehended and during his trial and as a, as a juvenile you know when i heard of his execution i wanted to learn more i didn't know much about john wayne gacy when i heard that he was executed so of course in the 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 days afterward i started reading up on this guy and and as as a, you know thankfully most of us grow mature and and learn and and change you know through life experiences and stuff like that and i think that i have since the time that i was out delivering papers on my blue dino bike but uh i thought the same thing i thought okay here's this kind of closeted homosexual and he's killing these kids and these young men to cover up really just wanting to have sex with them or or rape them and and to you know very quickly in later years later i changed my opinion of that i don't think that was that that may they he may have had some shame i hope he did have a lot of shame of who he was and the acts that he was doing he should he's a horrible person one of the worst ever and um you know when you have the clown community come out and say hey we're not bad people this is i think you want the 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 gay community to come out too because this is not who they are they're not monsters nobody's a mon- this guy is 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 a monster and he doesn't represent anybody but himself and i thought the same thing as a young as a young lad uh i thought you know here's this closeted guy that just wants to cover up who he really is and as I got older I realized no that's not the case this guy is something different than you and I this guy does not have wherever he doesn't have a soul and if he does it didn't come from the same place that yours came from or mine or or anybody else that I know for that matter one thing that I found interesting about uh I already referenced that book that that is like a must read in my opinion for for anybody that wants to learn more about John Wayne Gacy defending a monster, John Wayne Gacy defending a monster, check that one out. Another great book uh, that, that has a lot to do with Gacy. It's not, it's not a spotlight on him or his crimes, but uh, he's one of the individuals that is talked about quite a bit in this book. It's called the last victim by Jason Moss. Unfortunately, Jason Moss is no longer with us. I, he committed suicide quite some time ago. But um, the last victim, and Jason's talking about himself. He's labeling himself the last victim because in this book, it's all about his his life experiences of he starts writing to these horrible guys that are behind bars, and Gacy's one of them. He's writing and, and basically forming a, a pen pal type relationship with these monsters. And he becomes so close to Gacy to the point that Gacy invites him to come visit him in prison. And at some point, the two of them are left alone and Gacy tries to attack him. And what's what's interesting to me, Bill, is in Jason Moss's book, The Last Victim, and in the book, John Wayne Gacy Defending a Monster, they're both these two people worlds apart. You know, one is is his attorney defending him. One is decades later this pen pal that he that he has. They describe the exact same thing that they look over and Gacy is almost in a zombie like state, like he's like like Frankenstein eyes, right? Where you know Frankenstein doesn't know why he walks toward the victim. He doesn't know why he approaches the victim or, or pursues the the victim. He just does. And that's what Gacy was like. He went into this weird state of uh, his his defense attorney said that that Gacy's mind shifted so much in that moment that oddly enough, he didn't even appear to look the same. His face didn't even appear to look the same that he he shifted into this kill mode. And I believe that to be something that probably happened, unfortunately, 33 times, if not more. And he just shifted into this, he went full on monster, this, this monster that he's able to hide to the rest of the world, 90, 95% of the time, but he, he one-on-one with a potential victim, there's a shift there. And he, he would show his true colors and, and what he actually was 
in that moment and that's got to be the scariest thing ever to see that that face contort in right in front of your eyes and those and, and the, the eyes of this man turn to black or roll up in the back of his head as he's he's as he's choking you or uh working to end your life end your existence and i found it i found it absolutely ama- i mean just amazing I, I hate to use that word but i found it really incredible that these two individuals worlds apart are describing the exact same thing with this guy and how they both experienced that exact same thing for a brief period of time. They got to see what 33 individuals didn't live to tell anybody that they had seen. Yeah, that's absolutely crazy. I mean, are are we talking about, have we talked about Jeffrey, uh, the one that actually got away at the, in March? Rignall because um, you know he was chloroformed and he, he yeah. actually did he was somehow able to get away um, now he did he wasn't like I guess he didn't have the Gacy's name or something because the police did not investigate that particular incident and uh, it's kind of weird I don't know um, well it, you know in, but that in, was we probably have a we probably have a situation where more than one got away, got away, yeah. um, and didn't fully know what they were explaining or or what they were trying to tell police. In some of these occasions, or too, didn't even come forward because of the embarrassment of it. Well, and you know, unfortunately, rape is a very underreported crime, and in an obvious for obvious reasons. Uh, in this situation, it's going to be similar, where we're going to have underreported crimes by John Wayne Gacy and a large part of that bill is is not just the shame it's the the feeling that you've done something wrong yourself because you were hanging out at this man's house drinking his beers and smoking his pot yeah you're not going to run and tell the police hey I was underage drinking all day and night and and you know smoking weed with this guy and he he put the moves on me or he did something weird to me uh most people aren't going to go rat themselves out and we know as adults underage drinking or smoking a little pot that's not really a big deal but when you're 16 17 you're scared to death to tell your mom or dad that scared to death to tell the police that you were that you were engaging in such activities yeah and i take back back that the police did investigate him on the rignall case um they did get an arrest or a search warrant an arrest warrant i should say um but that's just nothing seemed to have come from that or just he must have been out on bail or something because he still went on to murder uh, f- four more people. I mean, he murdered. Uh, th- well, and think about the situation, people, too. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know that they were fully aware that clearly they weren't fully aware of what this guy was up to. But not only that, they don't have they don't have a murder victim. At that they just point, have an when they start victim, looking at right. it, yes, they just have an assault victim, and and it, and kind of a he said he said situation at that, right. and that's the that's the other problem too. You know, with Dahmer, Dahmer was uh, an expression I like to use that doesn't make any sense. Quick on his head feet, he was able to explain away some situations that he found himself in when he was face to face with police. Yeah, right, and that's because he. He was just kind of a, a smooth criminal like that, and he was he was smart and intelligent. And he could kind of talk his way out of something. Where Gacy, very much the same thing. You know, it, he he was, oh, uh, again, he was a well liked, well respected individual in this community in that neighborhood, and he he part of that is you look at a situation and you go, okay, well, we have this complaint here, and we have a we have a he said he said situation who am i going to believe this punk kid or the or this uh well-liked businessman and 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 that unfortunately that happened especially given the time i mean you go back in time and um that's that's just how the world yeah was. you get the benefit of the doubt as an adult and that's just the way it, the way yeah. it was back then you know it's it's really interesting this part i love you know i'm come just kind of going through the timeline and you know i I look at the part where it goes, yeah, the crawl space was getting, uh, was too full. So that's when he started throwing bodies into the river. <laughs> it's like, 
Man. And then he went, I mean, he killed. So, like, this is another example, though. This is kind of similar to Dahmer in the way that his crimes accelerated because, you know, he murdered in 72, at least we know of the 74 and 75. And it would seem like one murder every year or so. And then in 78, 76 to 78, he seemed to be killing a lot of people. And especially in the lead up to the Robert Peast murder, I mean, he had killed um, five people since the uh, July incident. And so, I mean, how many months are between July and December? Five. Well, and, and Gacy was the type that if it were up to him, he would have been doing this once a week for a very long time. Um he would have been doing this every chance he could get. He would and he would never have stopped unless he got caught. No. No, I mean you you know we have Dahmer who goes, "Hey, after you know when I did that the first time, I thought, well, never again. I'm never going to do this again and I'm going to put I'm going to take preventative measures to not do this again." No. Gacy was working on how as soon as he as soon his biggest problem was was disposing of the bodies was Gacy's biggest problem. And he, once he killed, his next move was, okay, I have to cover this up. And that's the only problem he had. He didn't have any problems of, oh, never again. I'm never inviting another 19-year-old guy over to my house again. I'm never employing another young man again. He didn't, no, no. As soon as he covered up the last murder, he was working on getting the next one. Yeah, I think if if he was... Yeah, he was always in in motion, is what I would call it, and that means yeah. he just always had another victim in line. I mean, it's kind of like BTK in that regard. I mean, he worked those victims. I mean, he would have always have like a list of people that he was kind of working and stalking. And uh, you know, going back to Dahmer and you talking about his interviews and him being really open about wanting to kind of know what the hell drove him to be so crazy. That's the one serial killer that I have sort of an ounce of empathy for because he did seem apologetic and he did seem like he just couldn't control himself. And he was unable he was, to stop. Yeah, unable to stop and didn't know how to do that. And I think that is a very interesting um you know, like you mentioned the alcohol and him being an alcoholic. Well, that was because he was he couldn't control his his murder, <laughs> murder, whatever uh, addiction. And um, it just made him more crazy. And, you know, you see it's like Bundy, like he accelerated his crimes. Dahmer accelerated his crimes. Gacy accelerated his crimes. I think these guys get more confident as they kill more people and get away with it. Though they get confident and they're they're also so addicted to their their behavior and their actions that they they get to a point, Bill, where they don't care if they get caught. They they, they just want to do what they I mean, obviously, they, I don't want it, to it's not that cut, you know, it's not that cut and dry. It, they do care that if they were to get caught because it would stop them from doing what it is that they want to do. But much like you see a recreational drug drug user turn into a full on addict the, and how their lives change. And, and they just get to a point. Some, some people just get to a point where they don't care if their family knows that they're drug addicted. They don't care if they're doing things to just feed their addiction. And that's what, what Gacy and Bundy and a lot of these guys end up becoming where they don't, they don't care anymore. If, if the world finds out that I'm this horrible monster, they don't care if they get caught, so to speak, they, they, their behavior becomes more risky because they, they just, they want to do this every minute of every day of, of their lives. And it's, it's a fantasy that they're chasing and that they're trying to live and relive and relive and relive time and time again. And so we always see a lot of times we see this downward spiral with these individuals that they just kind of spiral out of control and it's, they become like a frenzied killer almost at some point. And BTK is interesting in his own regard, because after he's caught the, the number one question everybody wanted to ask Dennis Rader was, well, how did you stop? You know, because he would go through these long periods of not killing anyone. And Dennis Rader explains to the world, 
Well, I never stopped. I never really stopped. I just was doing something different. I was always trolling. I was always watching potential victims and I was able to gain enough satisfaction or live through enough of the fantasy to kind of keep me, keep, keep me at bay here to, to, to keep me from actually killing. I was able to somewhat live, live that part and experience as much of that part as I could without actually committing the act. So I never really stopped. All these things were a process uh, and a part of the the act of killing for Dennis Rader. The trolling, the watching of victims, the keeping notes on people. And of course, we know a lot of his his disgusting uh, uh, behavior that he would do behind closed doors with himself. And so, it, you know, a lot of these, he had ways of living out that fantasy where where Gacy, Dahmer, Bundy, those those three couldn't do that on their own, where Dennis Rader could. And they needed they needed, unfortunately, a victim to live out that fantasy. That's so that is so true. And I think that's actually <clears throat> it's it's kind of interesting because those three are kind of the three that I've covered in the last two months. I know I didn't do like a specific episode on Bundy, but I started doing an an investigation that you know, into like a local cold case in Denver. And of course, like 20 minutes into researching Ted Bundy's name comes up as a possible, uh, you know, perpetrator. And I'm just like, Oh my gosh. Okay. So this is how it goes. Bundy just gets accused of everything because he was, but he was supposedly in the area at the time. But again, they couldn't stop themselves. The, the, the craziness eventually took over. I mean, the alcohol could only do so much for Dahmer. The necrophilia that Bundy participated in could only take him so far. I mean, and then Gacy, you know, he was clearly, uh, you know, a sadist and uh, just a complete sociopath. I mean, it <clears throat> started in 1972, ends in 1978. And if you want to like, you took me talk about that, you know, how quickly he was killing people. So like, here, here's a good example. Uh, let's see. December 12th, December 1st, 1976, Francis Alexander, Alexander. December 12th, 1976, Gregory Godzik. January 20th, John Allen Zick. March 15th. John Stephen Prestige. I mean, this guy was nonstop. Then he took six months off, <laughs> we think. And uh, September 15th was his next murder victim. Then October, then November, then December, then November again. He took an, an, he took the summers off in, in the last so, year. That's weird. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. People don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about the doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, undereating, or overeating. I like to think that I deal with my stresses by taking a little bit of mindfulness each day. And I do try to make it a point to focus on myself. Because stress shows up in all kinds of ways. And in a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time, here's your reminder to take care of yourself, do less, and maybe try some therapy. I've personally been in therapy since I was a child, and I would suggest it for everyone. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's so much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Who Killed Amy Maholovic listeners. Get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash who. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E lp.com slash who you know we talk we talk about <clears throat> Dahmer and we talked about Gacy and the difference between the two with Dahmer being kind of forthcoming slowly but but somewhat forthcoming about his 
his activities and the things he did and Gacy not so much. Now, Dahmer, I will say this. My my beliefs have always been that the only thing that Dahmer would probably not admit to is something that would be outside of of his other crimes, his known crimes. And, you know, there's always been the the uh, suspicion that maybe he was involved in Adam Walsh's I case. That up. And yep. I, I could see a situation where, where Dahmer would admit to everything except for if he did kill a kid, um, a youngster, that, that he may not ever admit to that. He's he was very aware that his father was paying attention to Dahmer news and Dahmer information, so that might be something that he he would have held back. In Gacy's case, you know, you look at Gacy and you go, okay, well, if he would have killed anybody else, we probably would have known about it because he 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 buried and and got rid of the bodies, so many of them at his own home and in in his own property. And, you know, we do have the four that we know that he put in the river. But with Gacy, I want to throw this out there, too. And this has always been a suspicion of mine. You know, Gacy would drive around looking for interactions with with young men and uh, teenage boys. And sometimes he would find them, you know, and they would get in his car. They might drive around again, drinking some beers, smoking some pot. And he's hoping one thing leads to another. And I... I have very strong suspicions that he may have killed one, two, or three guys or boys in his vehicle and just simply opened up the door and pushed them out and drove off. And and no one no one's the wiser because because an hour ago these two never met. They never they didn't know each other. There's no there's no connecting the dot but the dots between perpetrator and victim. And so I I I fully suspect that his his victim number is probably over 35 oh, and we got 33 that I we would, know i was of. gonna um, say 50 i i'm just well, saying that because that, of the you, fact that there's like these timelines you know there's six months that he's not doing anything like he could easily been doing exactly what you just said during that time just picking people up killing them and kicking them out of the cars opposed to burying them inside the crawl space then there's no connection to this individual and and the mm-hmm. dna didn't exist back then so it's not like they were able to i mean would you have fingerprints and blood type right and he really gacy really took off you know his his crimes really really uh were happening faster and in greater succession once once his second divorce took place and yes. so, you know, and, and, and that's similar to Dennis Rader. And we saw the same thing with uh, Gary Ridgway, the, the Green River Killer, where these guys fortunately get busy in their own personal lives and their hobby takes a back seat to their personal life. And yeah, I know it's disgusting to call it a hobby. That's their freaking hobby. Uh, killing people, uh, being a sadist, that's their, that's where they get their enjoyment. They get their pleasure from from other people's yeah opinion. i mean they the whole thing with gacy and Dahmer was really the whole thing about um control and you know like Dahmer wanted to create sex zombies <laughs> i didn't do much research on how to create a zombie because you really can't do that but um he tried <laughs> but but he certainly he tried. tried i mean come uh, on almost you know he's performing trying to perform lobotomies almost in his, in with his like apartment drill and, and hydrochloric uh, acid. With, with, yeah. Yeah. Let me put a little hole in your head, Bill. And uh, we'll see just what happens. Drop a little acid in there. And, and uh, we're hoping that all the, all the parts in your brain that allow you to control your motor functions and your, uh, your thoughts and, and all that. Let's, uh, let's do away with those. And, but we want to keep you alive. How sick is that? He like, wasn't he, that smart. I, he, I take that back. <laughs> Dahmer, well, yeah, but I mean, who, who's has anybody successfully made zombies? <laughs> no. I don't know. He gave it a good attempt, I guess, but um, he gave it an attempt. I don't know the, about good, <laughs> right? But uh, I mean, that's that's how sick Dahmer was. It, it, he needed he needed the victim to be alive and and to be a, alive as long as possible and under his control and possession as long as possible, where. Where you have Gacy, who just can't—he's more. 
he can't control himself. And that's why I, Gacy is the zombie. Right. And, and uh, you know, he's as described by, by potential victims, he turns into this, this Frankenstein like monster. And, and he's just, he's set on, on harming you and ending you. Yeah. I mean, they were all, he, he was so like in, uh, how do I say this? Um, without sounding crass, uh, Turn him and burn him is basically uh, is the way that I look at Gacy. You know, he was wanted victims and he wanted them fast and furious, and uh, he didn't care about you know revisiting the bodies such as Bundy and Dahmer. I mean, he would go out of his way to dispose of the bodies, not go out of his way, but like to actually. I mean, using lime, it took a long time to identify these bodies. You know, because they were all chemically reduced to you know dental records and other stuff but uh yeah i would say that gacy was definitely one of those people that was more of like a impulse um killer like it was uh he killed and then he well, and then he was done with it yeah and, and again it's once once he's got you alone in his house or alone in his car he set everything into motion at that point he was very much a premeditated murderer um but you're right the impulse takes over once he's got you one-on-one and the oldsmobile that he drove around and you talked about him potentially luring victims in and then just doing what he does and kick you know killing them and then pushing them out it's you know it's interesting those dogs you know that when they went and searched his house that the the um, cadaver dogs obviously went and they located in the, you know, the passenger seat they they were smelling and you got to wonder how many different victims <laughs> that could have possibly been uh, in that seat right. and so yeah and we know he was driving some of them to the river we know that so, for a fact uh, yeah he he, had, he admitted yeah. that now he did yeah. tell investigators he threw five bodies in the river and one interesting thing is he thought one of them landed on a barge. So that's interesting. Um, would hate to be with the workers that uh, discovered that. <laughs> right. But yeah, um, John Wayne Gacy. He is definitely one of those characters that you don't want to run into ever. And I would say um, Dahmer and Bundy would be the same and we are all lucky that they are not around anymore and yes he was uh, executed on May was it May 10th 1994 yep May 10th 1994 and just like Bundy they did actually have a thousand people gathered outside the correctional center so um, some people wore (laughs) t-shirts They say uh, it's a no tears for the clown. So, you know, again, right. it's it's like luckily um, the investigators and the advancements in DNA have been able to identify, I believe, all of the victims. Um, but again, you can go back to the 70s and there are probably so many missing person cases that are unsolved that could probably be traced back to Gacy but uh, wasn't there another case that they thought Gacy might have been involved with like another uh, high profile case was it was it one of the cases in Chicago I'm trying to think or maybe it was the I don't know I'm I'm confusing the serial killers (laughs) potentially well he I I do know in Gacy's case that there was a a victim that they thought they thought this one individual fell victim to to Gacy because I believe they found a piece of jewelry that either belonged to this individual or was very close you know identical to the one that belonged to this individual and luckily for him and for his family he wasn't a victim of John Wayne Gacy's uh, they they found him living in like Florida decades later. He was somebody that just he he was a teenager, sixteen, seventeen years old, that ran away from home, and for whatever reason he didn't want to have any contact with his family. But he ran away from home right around the same time that that 
Gacy's getting all these victims, you know, that he's victimizing all these people and killing all these kids. And he fell in that age group and that victimology. And so his family, having seen that piece of jewelry that looked like something that would have belonged to their kid, they believed for, for years and years that their son, their brother, had was a John Wayne Gacy victim and was dead. And it wasn't until like years later, yes. I believe the guy was watching some true crime show on TV and he's like, they think I'm, they think I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they think I'm a I pinch myself. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still here. And, and so he did contact, I think he contact law enforcement and just said, Hey, let, let the world know that I'm alive or let my p- family know that I'm alive. That's, that's, that, that would be so weird. Yeah. So what I was talking about was the, Casey actually talked to Robert Ressler and he said, you know, this goes back to what you were talking about earlier in the episode about how there were possible, you know, other accomplices and, and whatnot. And, you know, he, he told Ressler that two or three PDM employees had assisted in several murders. Now, again, this is just as according to Ressler. Ressler, Ressler, <laughs> Why can't I say that name? Wrestler believed there were unexplained avenues to the case and that Gacy had killed more than 33 victims in multiple states. Neither or Gacy neither confirmed nor denied Wrestler's suspicions. Hmm. Yeah, so with with Gacy, here's here's my thoughts, and I'm not gonna discredit the great Robert Wrestler. Um Wrestler's probably spot on with his his thoughts. But Gacy saying that he had help. Well, let's let's factor in a couple things here. First of all, one, Gacy was always trying to diminish his personal responsibility in these homicides. He was always attempting to do that. So even if that meant throwing other people under the bus and bringing them into the fold, that fully makes sense. That's spot on with everything that Gacy was attempting to do once he was caught, once he was outed for for being this horrific individual. And so it, I I believe that Gacy fully believed. Again, he's he's a charming individual. He's he's liked. He's somebody that if you sat unfortunately if you sat across the table from him, we would probably enjoy his company. Um and like the thing Kemper. is Yeah, he he's the type that he's going to he fully believed that he could get himself out of that death penalty and he was going to he was going to weasel his way into doing that as every chance he got. And when talking with the FBI, of course, he's going to go, these PDM employees, yeah, they did whatever I said. Or or some of them, they were just as sick as I was. They, uh, they, Some of these guys committed the murders. Now, some of his employees, we know for a fact, helped him conceal bodies, whether they knew that they were concealing bodies or, or, or just doing work for him at his home. I mean, you referenced the lie thing, and one of... When he started running out of space in the crawl space, I believe he he built one of the victims into uh, one of the rooms of his home. Like he remodeled one of the rooms in his in his home and kind of built one of them into the construction of that into one of the walls or the flooring or something. I I can't recall exactly what it was. Might have been in his dining room or something like that. But um, so these individuals did help him in a way by doing these projects for Gacy at his home. Now, I don't I don't personally believe that they were aware that they were covering up homicides when they were assisting him. But let's also factor in the thing that we talked about earlier about him going into this zombie like state. You know, I keep keep saying Frankenstein's monster because that's what I, I picture when when these guys describe Gacy and his behavior I I fully believe that on some of these killings, if not all of them, that at some point he does slip away from all reality. And then when he comes back to there's this there's this dead victim in in my bedroom. There's this dead victim in my basement. There's uh my god, what have I done? You know, we heard Dahmer in his own words say that in this hotel room, I had a I I had a man back there with me, and I got so stinking drunk that I woke up in the morning, and the guy was dead, and I had marks and bruises and cuts all over me, and I realized I must have beat this man to death. He he doesn't even recall doing anything to the guy, and I think he's being one hundred percent honest when he says that to us. And so I think in Gacy's situation, 
out of these 33, probably once, twice, maybe a dozen times or more, he experienced a situation where he slipped out of all reality as we know it. And when he came to, he's got a victim in front of him and he's not fully aware of of what happened, how it all went down, or if he's 100% responsible. Yeah. <clears throat> I would say the the idea that he would put the blame on other people is totally in uh in line with um with what he you know it's, it's of course he doesn't want to get executed um you know it's uh it's weird uh, i i just gacy gacy just is kind of the worst person i mean i know that you have i, I assume that it has got to be based off of G- gacy by stephen king um you know attacking kids and all that stuff and being a killer clown but uh you know one of the things that he actually did that was actually interesting you know they had that 72 hour waiting period for forever uh and the guy that actually defended uh Gacy one of them I don't, I'm not sure if it's the guy who wrote the book or not um, yeah, there were a few that, that yeah. defended him over the years because he had appeals and such. Sure. So it, in 1984, they actually passed the Illinois Missing Child Recovery Act, and that is where it was the 24-hour. They they eliminated the 72-hour waiting period, and then it eventually evolved into the Amber Alert. So, you know, at least Gacy gave us that, you know? Well, uh, yeah. But, and, uh, and some y- paintings. <laughs> Yeah, he was quite the uh, terrible artist once he, once he was living in, in prison. Yeah. Uh, so Gacy, yeah, Gacy was a painter in prison. He he painted birds, Christ, skulls, his own. Some home. of his paintings have Giant. sold for considerable amounts of money and um, twenty thousand dollars. And I, you know, I don't want to tell anybody what to do or not to do with their money, but. Uh, you know, as as an individual who's been eyeballs deep in true crime for since I can remember, uh, I have never understood, never will I understand these people that that want to collect murder memorabilia. It makes no sense to me. I, you know, you and I had the same discussion with Bill Thomas uh, when when he was on your show, and I love Bill. Shout out to Bill Thomas. Uh, you know, one thing that that was very upsetting to me, the first couple crime cons I went to when I would meet. And these are great people. These are, you know, great people that you're meeting at these events at crime con and such. But I would always get very angry when I would hear someone say so and so's my favorite serial killer. I mean, c- come on, you know, like I, I get I get that it, a certain individual may intrigue you that I certainly get the interest in these individuals because that's what I do. That's who I am too. And, but I've never understood the, uh, so-and-so is my favorite serial killer and, uh, never will. I, the other thing that's bizarro to me too, is the men and women, men do it too. The, the, the individuals that, start writing to a killer. Now I'm not talking bad against Jason Moss, Jason Moss, his book, he's, he's doing it to try to understand these individuals and to remind everybody of, of what these people are and and how terrible they are. But I'm talking about the ones that uh, are looking to hook up or looking to uh, find their future husband or wife. Uh, And I've, I've just never understood any of that. Yeah. I can't ever imagine purchasing a, t-shirt or uh anything along those lines with a serial killer uh, picture on it or mugshot or anything like that uh it's definitely a gross thing it's like the people who collect nazi memorabilia and uh hitler stuff yeah just a bunch of uh uh that's just not my bag and uh pretty gross on those people's end but yeah i definitely would say that uh gacy uh, Gacy did do us uh, a service by uh, bringing the Amber Alert. That's probably saved a lot of lives. But uh, I am pretty confident that if he was not caught, he probably would have been caught in the next year or two because of the acceleration of his crimes and yeah. how quickly he was going downhill. 
because his neighbors did say that they started to notice a little bit of erratic behavior in those in the last year and so it's like they talk about seeing the lights come on and come off you know in the middle of the night talk about cars leaving in the middle of the night at weird hours and returning at weird hours so it's like okay well we know what he's doing at that time he was taking the bodies and throwing them off the bridge or he was going cruising whatever he was doing and um i think that if he wasn't busted by the De Plains police officers in uh illinois that after robert was you know abducted and murdered then I think he would have eventually been caught probably by 80 because there's just no oh, way. Yeah. There's no way. There were too many people disappearing. And I'm still surprised it's only 33 victims. Well, and it, it, I'm actually surprised he wasn't caught sooner. I mean, the, the behavior was already out of control to the point where it's, it's no longer uh, even being covered up very well. So I, I'm a little surprised that it lasted as long as it did. And I think that goes back to his where he was in that community and his his where he put himself. And that's what a lot of these guys will do, too. They they will build their lives around this portion of themselves. And I, I think that Gacy very much did that. You know, he, he, he wanted to be uh, somebody who was important. He wanted to be successful. He wanted to be somebody who, who was in power to, to help him procure these victims. And, uh, and he very much did that. And so a lot of the things he did in his life were, premeditated to leading to to murder and to um getting these victims and doing the the terrible sick horrible horrible things that that we know that he did yeah i think that this guy uh got what he deserved and there is no doubt about it and uh the fact that he was stacking bodies it's like can we talk about the fact that he had 28 bodies underneath his home doesn't that smell eventually yeah well and we we have people years later and i think that it was in uh one of the books that i've referenced that they talked about um several people spoke about being in his home and there always being this like terrible terrible odor but they would say that when the uh when the heat or the or the ac would kick on that it, the overwhelming smell of death, like it, like it, because it's just pumping through the vents and blowing uh, around the home, and uh, so that was something that was that was going on. He was able to mask that a little bit, but when the when the AC or the heat would kick on, and he and Gacy was very much aware of that. Uh, there were there were people that said that he. Uh, as soon as it would kick on, he would go over to the thermostat and adjust it so that it would very quickly turn off uh, when they were they were in his home. So there were a lot of people, as weird as it is and as hard to believe as it is, that were in his home after he had dozens of bodies concealed in the home. Unbelievable is really what I have to say to that. And when you have to turn off your air conditioning or your heat because you're your body basement is becoming over, too overwhelming. I think it's time to stop murdering people. <laughs> it's just, well, yeah. I mean, I think, I think he must have enjoyed the smell. Like, no, I, I don't know. I, I mean, who knows? Who knows? Dude, he's living Wait, with it, dead it, bodies. There's, there's no way for you and I to fully identify with him. So I, True. I don't know that we're going to be able to. Now, did, didn't he live with his mom too? Uh, his mom lived there for a portion of it, but I believe, okay. um, he, you know, we, as strange as it sounds, he was very much a mama's boy. Um, I, I, I don't know any other way to put it. He, I believe as hard as it is to believe, I believe he did care for his mom and, 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 and tried to take good care of her. Um, yeah, he, he was very much a mama's boy and that's the thing. Again, that's what makes him so scary and made him so, forgive me for using the word, successful at, at killing was that he was able to turn it on and turn it off. And when he turned it on, he was he was a charming, 
individual. He was he was well liked. He was um, he was he was somebody that people, um, you know, he he was outgoing. He he was he was that guy. He could walk into a room and and chat anybody up. Yeah, he was gregarious and and personable, and that is an attractive quality to people. And again, that's one of the things that made him such a vicious killer because he could lure you in with such innocent ideas, and then all of a sudden, just like you said, he just flips a switch and he's pure evil at this point. Mm-hmm. So it's just. Uh, pretty wild and um you have any final thoughts on mr gacy uh i don't have any final thoughts on him but i it's again he's one of those weird ones because i will always remember where i was when i heard john wayne gacy was executed i knew very little about him other than he had killed a lot of people and um you know it was it, it, I'll never forget that. I, I'll never forget being out on my paper route and hearing the 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 broadcaster come over the radio waves and say, "Today, this morning, serial killer John Wayne Gacy, the killer of thirty more than thirty uh, men, uh, has been put to death by the state of Illinois." So I'll I'll never forget that. Yeah, but, you would have uh, been in your prime teenage years to go look that up. <laughs> yes, and um. One thing, I, if you're okay with it, Bill, I'd like to to plug before Absolutely. we wrap up here. Do it. I have a new I have a new show that I've been doing for a while now called The Big Kid Show, and it has nothing to do with true crime. It's uh, very much uh, uh, based around being a child of the '90s. You know, while we're talking about uh, our our things from from yesteryear, but uh, yeah, we talk talk a lot of uh, sports, movies, uh, food, TV video games, just a lot of stuff from uh, childhood, and that's why it's called The Big Kid Show. It's a podcast. It's available everywhere. Uh, if you're looking for something, you want a little humor, you want something fun to listen to, uh, something to pick pick you up maybe while you're at the gym or in the car, uh, check out that show. It's and not doom and gloom like uh, True Crime Garage. Which Who's hey, your host on that show? Co-host. Uh, I, two of my friends that, that I've, one guy that I grew up with, uh, so the, the conversation is very much relevant to our, our childhood and, um, and, a, a, then a longtime friend of his. So, uh, nice. a guy named Brian and a guy named Mark, uh, two good guys out of, of, out of Cincinnati, uh, Ohio. So, uh, yeah, check out the big kid show. All right. Well, I'll give my two plugs then. check out the other two shows that I produce crime capsule as well as press box access, which is a sports show and that is uh hosted by todd jones who is a great writer for the ohio state alumni magazine and he does great interviews with former sports writers current sports writers and nick i think you would absolutely love that show um yeah i'll check it out definitely check it out and if you do get an opportunity to share it with your people it's definitely a show i feel like people should really listen to because it's some of the greatest sports stories I've ever heard in my life and he's about 29 episodes in and definitely worth a, a worth a listen so uh, I appreciate the uh, if you check it out but I, I just wanted to plug that because uh, it, it's a really good show and he's really well researched and uh, it's again it's a show that I produce for evergreen podcasts as well as crime capsule so yeah, and I I want to thank you, Bill, for having me on again. It's always fun to come on your show. I I love I love you. I love your audience. And um, love you too, Nick. Uh, yep, love you, man. Uh, love you, man. Check out uh, check out True Crime Garage. That's where that's that's where I live, and that's where where Bill found me uh, in the garage. And uh, check out the other show, The Big Kids Show. Thanks so much, Bill. I appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. And I uh, look forward to CrimeCon uh, 2022. So yeah. Vegas, baby. steak dinner on you. You got it, buddy. You got it. <laughs> Thanks again. Cheers, Nick. man. Cheers. Yep. See ya. See ya. And that will do it for John Wayne Gacy and the killer clown. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to this week's episode. And I will be dropping new episodes, as you know, every Friday. And again, you can download episodes wherever you get your favorite podcasts check out Nick's show wherever you find your podcast as well. They do have a bunch of stuff on Stitcher. They've, I think they're over 500 episodes or close to it. So it's pretty wild. And I would say, uh, 
They are definitely one of the best podcasts out there. Again, CrimeCon 2022. If you guys want to save on your ticket, please use my promo code WHO at checkout and save 10%. Actually, I think it's WHO KILLED, so I apologize. WHO KILLED? And that is for CrimeCon 2022 in Las Vegas. And that is April 29th to May 1st. I will be there with all the other popular podcasts in the true crime genre. So, again, if you guys want to help support the show, you can do so by submitting a donation via Venmo with my username at bill-huffman-3, or you can use PayPal, and you can find a link on slowburnmedia.com. That's slow minus the W. You can also follow me on Twitter at billhuffman3. And again, thank you to Nick for coming on this past two weeks, and hope you guys enjoyed a little brief overview of the killer clown and again i'll be dropping new episodes every friday like i said and as always i hope that you guys stay healthy and be safe Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. The crime was so brutal it was compared to the Manson murders. Mary and Bill, an Ohio cold case, explores what it takes to bring new attention to an unsolved double homicide and turns up new hope for answers. Listen to Mary and Bill, an Ohio cold case from Ideastream Public Media, wherever you get your podcasts.